Okay, um, we finished our last panel of the day and we had two days of very rich and fruitful discussion. We are now in the closing session of our symposium and the first item on the menu for um, the closing session is uh, closing reflections by myself and by one of our student panelists. So I'm going to get Taylor to come on stage with me. And as Taylor is coming on, I'm, I'm just going to make a couple of brief remarks. We had two days of rich conversation. We know that the higher education sector is complex to navigate. It encompasses societal and individual perspectives. Actually, sorry, not societal, but systems perspectives. One of the themes that's emerged is that higher, ed higher education equity is not a zero-sum game, and we really need to cooperate and collaborate as a sector in order to make meaningful progress on what we want. Um, but thankfully, there's plenty of goodwill in the sector. We also need to bear in mind that the Accord sets out multi-decadal reform, um, so a lot of stuff is coming into the future, but the clock is ticking and we can't wait for action one year, two years, ten years from now. Some of the action actually has got to start today, and we need to have both a short-term and long-term perspective for meaningful change. There's plenty of lessons that we can learn from the discussion, but I'm going to let Taylor um, have the first word because she asked for it. Um, and it's also critical for us to hear from the students, as we have actually um, mentioned this morning. So I'm going to introduce Taylor. Taylor comes from a regional background. She's from Streaky Bay in South Australia. You've heard that this morning. She's uh, that's 700 um, kilometers away from Adelaide. She's a member of the Ministerial Reference Group for the Australian Universities Accord. She's a rural youth ambassador. She studies in medicine at Flinders, and she's a passionate advocate for rural students. You've heard that all before at the panel this morning, uh, but I thought it's still important to, to, to say that just in case some people joined uh, the live stream or the symposium late. I've also asked Taylor to share with me an interesting fact about herself that we haven't heard at the symposium so far. So the interesting fact about Taylor is that her claim to fame dish that she would cook if she was trying to improve, uh, impress someone is a classic vanilla sponge roll with strawberries on top. <laughs> so Taylor, over to you. achieve incredible outcomes in the sector. Now, I've spent the last hour or so consulting with the students here today to get some of their insight about what the most um, biggest key takeaways from the symposium have been. So firstly, the importance of maintaining connections between universities and students on an ongoing basis that fosters an environment for growth. So about keeping the unis accountable to ensure that those connections are long lasting. Omar Khan also raised an important point about the language around equity and that students shouldn't feel segregated by the choice of language. He also discussed um, summer school and how that this can help students um, become interested in university if they've never considered it before. We've also explored how TAFE and VET pathways can help increase participation in higher education. And we've also discussed how the Accord is a step in the right direction. However, we need to ensure that what they didn't get right is fixed down the track um, and I think that that's definitely been brought up over the last two days. I think we really need to consider how are we measuring success because success looks different for every single individual. Um, it's not homogenous and it really needs to be individualised. Equity programs need to be specialised and targeted to specific groups once again for each individual. Um, is, is there a way that we can unite student equity representatives so that they can collaborate? So I've been fortunate enough to meet some of the equity representatives over on this side of the room here and I think it'd be great if they could collaborate from their different universities to see what they can achieve. The importance of paid placements and income support to aid with the cost of living crisis has been very prevalent in all of our discussions and I hope that it's something that continues. 
we've heard about the harmonisation of different higher education higher education with early education to ensure kids are having a strong start right from an early age. We've heard about how valuable student voices and how universities can ensure that they're listening and how we can integrate student voice into policies at a higher level, not just through student unions but working with the federal government as well. And I think one of the biggest key takeaways from the whole symposium has been our discussions around aspirations and how do we inspire the future generations to follow their dreams and how do we support them to get there. I'll now hand over to Ian and I've got a little fun fact about him. So he is the Director of Research and Policy here at Access and we all know that he does a bit of magic. We saw his skills yesterday but he actually learned that magic in the Singaporean army, which is pretty cool. Um, I've never heard of magic in the army before, so I'll hand over to him. Thank you, Taylor. I'll just say that in the army, you spend a lot of time bored and waiting for stuff to happen. So <laughs> that's the reason. Well, Taylor and the students certainly had the first word, but I'm not going to say that we'll be having the last word over here because I think that what we've got from the two days is a lot of food for thought. There's a lot of conversations that need to happen, but beyond that, we also need to not just talk and actually start doing some things. So I have three key messages that I would like to share. My first key message is actually um, overlapping a little bit with Taylor's last message around aspiration. So one of the things that spoke to me a lot in the last two days was the line around aspirations, you can't be what you can't see. We really do need to work within communities and with the people that we would like to see the change in and understand what success means to different people and how we can help to achieve it. But I also would like to tweak that line a little bit and we can't be who we can't see as well. And I think you know, and one of the themes that emerged as well was the academic university professional workforce we need in the future to actually support this change. Um, I believe in one of the earlier panel sessions, someone spoke about the fact that workforce planning is notorious for being hard. But just because it's hard doesn't mean that we don't need it. Workforce planning takes a long time to actually put into implementation. Whatever you need in 10 years' time is usually what you need to start putting into action today. So I think we really need to get a move on for that. The second message is that there's lots of stuff that needs doing, emerging from the accord, other pressures in the higher, higher education sector. We have a very ambitious agenda, but the difficult question when you have so much on your plate is what you do first and what you do later on. Prioritization is the key. What comes first? What is highest value? What is lower value? What is needed now? What can wait a little bit longer? What should go ahead now without waiting for ATAC, for example? Those are really important questions that the sector needs to address. And the last point that has come up again and again, including at um, the sessions um, today, this morning and this afternoon, is about evidence-based policy making. Data is the boring thing that people always don't really think of, but it is part of what drives decision making. We need to actually incorporate evidence base in our policy and practice changes. We have very limited resources in higher education and we can't afford to squander those resources. So we need robust evaluation, we need an evidence base and we need data to support that. The irony of it is that there's lots of data that's lying around in the higher education sector. The problem is with access to it. The problem is with, well, methods exist to link it. Some of my work has focused on actually proving that this can be done very quickly and very cost effectively. The problem lies in, I think, legislation. Some of that can be ambiguous. The problem lies is in, in ambiguity about ownership. These are all problems that are difficult, but they do require a solution. And I believe that's a solution that we as a sector can move together to actually address it because it seems to be so high on everybody's agenda. So with that, I'll leave you all to think about the way to move ahead. I would again like to thank Taylor, the student panelists for today, and actually all our speakers and panelists for actually contributing to the great discussion. Thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking everyone for your contributions. And thank you, Taylor.
we are now moving to the next item, which is uh, uh, the closing keynote address by Luke Sheehy, who is the CEO of Universities Australia. So Luke sends his apologies. He can't be with us in person today, but he's kindly recorded his closing keynote, and we are playing that on the screen now. Good afternoon. My name is Luke Sheehy, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Universities Australia. Thank you to the Australian Centre for Student Equity and Success for the kind invitation to provide this message today. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Can I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which you have gathered and pay my respects to Elders past and present and acknowledge any First Nations Australians with you today? Like many of you at Western Sydney University today, I'm passionate about equity in education and the power of education to transform lives. Universities are at the centre of that. My own personal story goes to this. I'm the first member of my family to graduate from university, and it's not something I've ever taken for granted. I don't think I would be in the position I am today if I hadn't had the opportunity to experience the power of education. It is undeniably powerful. I feel that in my own experiences and life. And that's what drives me today in my role as CEO of Universities Australia and in my previous roles in the sector, to open the door of university for as many people as possible. Our university system is very good in a lot of ways. We punch above our weight in research. We are a leading destination for international students. We educate close to a million domestic students each year who join the skilled workforce and drive our future prosperity. And we are a trusted partner of the government and our communities in supporting national and local priorities. But we can always do better for the students we teach and the communities we represent for and on behalf of our country. Professor Mary O'Kane has made it clear we don't really have a choice. In her final report to the government, she wrote that the university system needs to constantly grow and improve to meet Australia's needs in the future. Educating more students is at the heart of her findings. The Accord final report tells us universities need to double the number of domestic students they educate each year to meet the nation's skills needs, from around 900,000 now to 1.8 million in 2050. This is a significant undertaking one we must start now. As we approach this task, equity must be at the centre of our thinking. It is certainly front of mind for, for Professor O'Kane. The Accord final report mentions equity more than 200 times, and for good reason. The only way to increase the number of people studying at university is to significantly increase the number of students who are currently underrepresented in our system. Students from the outer suburbs and regions, students from poor backgrounds, students with a disability, Indigenous students. When you look at the numbers, you realise how much work we have in front of us. To meet the Accord's attainment targets, 60% of new students entering the system will need to come from low SES backgrounds. More than half will need to come from regional and remote areas. And more than 10% will need to be First Nations students. If we don't meet these targets, we won't have the skills and the economic firepower we need to make this country everything it can be in the years ahead. Minister Clare needs no convincing of how important this task is. He has stated repeatedly that he doesn't want us to be a country where your chances in life depend on your postcode, your parents or the colour of your skin. I think we are all with the Minister in believing that university education should be open to the many, not the few. The Governor's decision to uncap university places for all Indigenous students, regardless of their postcode, is a welcome step. So is the removal of the punitive 50% pass rule under the Job Ready Graduates Package, which disproportionately affected students from underrepresented backgrounds. Equity is simply not simply about building aspiration for prospective university students to access higher education. It's about getting on as much as getting in. We need to recognise that people from groups underrepresented in higher education 
require greater support to succeed. The attainment rate for Indigenous people in major in urban areas, for example, is only 14% compared to almost 50% for the non-Indigenous population. So how do we support these students to succeed, to have a memorable experience at university and go on and make a significant contribution to society? The Accord final report is full of ideas, many of which University of Australia and others have advocated for. Changes to help repayments and funding for paid placements are worthy steps to remove financial barriers to study and they are big wins for students in the current cost of living crisis. Fee-free preparatory places could also help shift the dial. These courses are proven to help students from underrepresented backgrounds qualify for university entry. Better aligning education, higher education and VET would help students navigate these systems and make qualification attainment faster and easier. And a needs-based funding model that acknowledges the cost of additional support for underrepresented students and the locality of the institution they attend would ensure universities can support these students on their learning journey. The benefits of higher education to these students, their families, their communities and the nation are worth every cent. Announcement in last week's federal budget to boost equity show Minister Clare is so far putting his money where his mouth is. We have some promising initial reforms to work from and if we can bake equity into the centre of our thinking then we will have risen to the challenge. That is what students and the nation need and deserve. Thank you. And last but not least, um, there's lots of um, ending speeches and sort of farewells. I'll just take sort of five or six minutes. Um, I'm not remotely going to try to um, cover what Ian um, Taylor and, in fact, Luke was saying. I thought it was all very, you know, very sensible and uh, makes a lot of sense, really well spoken. And baking it in, I think, was a summary I heard Luke say a moment ago. So for me, in a sense, this has been a great conversation. It's been delightful for us to be able to convene this. And I can sense a subtle, I can't imagine, I don't think I've imagined it, but a subtle shift to it becoming not a what discussion, but increasingly a how discussion. Um, and that emphasis needs to be reinforced, 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 uh, because ultimately it will depend quite a lot on having good answers to the how. And that is a real clarion call for people involved in research, in policy and practice. If there's ever time for them to sort of get together and get themselves sorted out, so to speak, vis-a-vis -vis Canberra, this would be a really good time in my view. So I hope we've sort of helped to um, facilitate that little shift there. Um, I'm not going to go through all the themes. I think you guys covered it really well. I thought there was lots of sort of um, hanging points that still need to be picked up at later stages. There were some interim sort of conclusions. I thought you summarized that perfectly. Um, I guess there was one exception to that, and it did crop up. And I think Dylan was the most passionate earlier this morning. I, I can't see him. He may have gone. There he is, Dylan. But I'll tell you what I heard him say. Um, apologies, Dylan. But he did sort of say, in fact, got very close to saying, um, Australian universities may have lost their way. They've become very, very much like businesses, and they become very corporatized, and they become very, very bottom line, all of which I think we can you know, understand and frankly explain. But I think it's not going to serve us well if we're talking about expanding the sector and baking in equity, which is essentially the agenda. That is not going to be um, a great set of tools to work with. So I don't I have no idea how you reverse or put in place um, universities which you know, celebrate and are good at knowledge as end in themselves rather than as a means to an end. Uh, I think they're going to be both, but I think the emphasis on the end in itself is clearly missing. I have no idea how you do that, but I do think it's going to be vital that that is sort of, if not baked in, it's, sort of, it's, it's not an afterthought. It has to happen at the same time. It may fall to a new generation of university leaders, for example. And I think that's an important sort of thing I didn't hear, except... Um, your comment on this, and I think it came out of frustration, and you, uh, and you can hear in my voice I share the same frustration. Um, everyone's had a crack at sharing an anecdote. Why don't I? Um, I'm 30-odd, 40-odd years 
academic social scientists, you know, we don't do anecdotes, we do big studies and scientifically weighted surveys, but let's make an exception. Um, several decades ago, I was in the compulsory schooling system. Uh, I was in a, what we call a SYNC school, a SYNC comprehensive in the UK, that speaks for itself, <laughs> SYNC, wasn't going very well. You'd be lucky to get one, two or three people out of a large comprehensive school going to university in any one year. I think it was one of three out of a school of, I don't know, maybe 1,600 people, with the exception to prove the rule. Well, good on me, I made it. I made my way to the headmaster's office, the principal, as you say, in Australia, and he said, oh, anyone who wants to think about going to university, come and see me between this hour and that hour. I think it was a Tuesday, by memory. Stick with me with this anecdote. It's going to sort of peak, hopefully, in a second. Um, and I did. He, he wasn't washed out with diary appointments, let me put it that way. There could be no more than half a dozen people who made his way. And I... I, I, I impressed him or whatever, I have no idea what I said. And he said at the end of this, and it's an absolute true story, and, and I'm using it for the second time, it's on the HeadX podcast. Um, and he said, look, Shamit, um, you should really think long and hard. I think he was just trying to be nice. Think, think long and hard about going to Oxbridge. I'm holding it up just to... Anyone from the UK, and most Australians will know, that's shorthand for Oxford or Cambridge, right? i would never heard that term before. I was so impressed. I thought, this guy thinks I should go to Oxbridge. I had no idea that it was a summary for two universities. I thought it was a university. In fact, I went home that evening. I said to my father, great role model in my life, Dad, Dad, the headmaster thinks I should go to Oxbridge. <laughs> UX. I had never heard of Oxbridge, but I'd heard of Uxbridge, which, for those of you who don't know, is a West London suburb with a tube station. <laughs> and I immediately said to him, Dad, let's look up Uxbridge. It's pre pretty internet land. You can't just sort of type it into a bloody phone. You've got to... I thought it was funny. I've told the story a couple of times. My kids still sort of tease me about it. But believe you me, it's, it's a pretty powerful story, not just for me, because it just makes a very simple point. If you don't know, you don't know. So on a good day, I might have sort of filed an application and sent it to the University of Uxbridge. God knows where it got. I bet it didn't get to Oxford or Cambridge. And all he was saying was, oh, look, you know, you, you're probably not going to make it, but just raise your ass. He, he meant well. I won't overdo the anecdote, but it's an entirely true anecdote. Never for, I've never forgotten it. And I've absolutely vowed to make sure that um, that gap in my knowledge for the next generation, I don't mean for my kids, my kids are privileged kids, but kids who are not privileged, that gap is not replicated if it's at all possible. It's a really simple thing to get wrong. It must be going on every day of the week in Australia and elsewhere. And I have no idea what the policy tools are to solve that other than to keep it in our line of sight. Because these other barriers we've been talking about, if I may say so, I don't mean to be funny, look relatively easy or easier to combat, because we can actually define them, or we can think about some of the tools to do so. This is hard. This is about awareness and connectivity and so on. Anyhow, you've got my point. Let me move on and do the last bit of housekeeping. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the conversation. Our job is to convene this. We don't have the answers, but we think it's pretty important for the sector and their friends uh, to have robust conversations. This is just the first time we've had an inaugural symposium. Please keep in touch with the centre. Um, we have uh, directors present, we've got the, the, the comms team present, got the deputy, a whole bunch of them here, I'm sure you've made sort of broken the ice. They're very keen to hear from you. Uh, some of them, you're hearing, they're hearing from you already, I think, you know, which is good. And look, we're, we're all ears, you know, we are literally here to help the sector raise its game on equity. And we have pretty agnostic about what that might mean, other than uh, a fairly dull insistence that evidence is important and we're not going to let go of that. So that's kind of our mission, if you want. Uh, elsewhere, um, there are some up, up and coming things. Um, this symposium uh, appears on the YouTube for, without, uh, without much delay. We've got a brand new All Singing, All Dancing website, which has quite a lot of user interactivity built into it. There are many more things in the um, Australian Centre for Equity, Student Equity, than what we presented here. Time prevents us going into that. So please do that. And of course, last but not least, uh, you might want to clear some sort of slot in your diary for next May for 2025 symposium. My staff know that I drive a hard bargain, I'm difficult to please. But I do think, actually, we should you know, pick that date, pick a venue. It's going to be Perth. We're not coming here. We're going to go to Perth. Um, 
It's far too cold for people like me here. Um, but we're going to also, I think, you know, all years, if you think there are big topics or sets of topics, I mean, the cord was the easy thing. Obviously, we're going to, not easy, but it was the thing that suggested itself. But there may be a set of issues that you think could turn into a kind of big, crunchy theme. I think we're kind of receptive. Uh, in fact, it occurs to me you wouldn't do it in May because you've got a distraction of a federal election. So maybe two months before or two months after. But anyhow, you'll hear from us. There will be 2025 Policy Symposium. You're very welcome, and you're very welcome to get involved, not just, you know, sort of wait to hear from us. And then lastly, but uh, not least, uh, I've got lots of people to thank. Um, I could thank WSU and Barney, uh, our sort of landlord. He's no longer the vice chancellor. So thank you, WSU, for um, hosting us here. It's been great. Great for me to come back. Lots of conversations, lots of good WSU students we've been interacting with. Uh, we've got uh, Harleen Hayne, my vice chancellor, I think, is on a plane back to Perth, who's also the chair of the board. Um, but last and not least, okay, and most important of all, um, I am absolutely served by an excellent team. You can see their pictures behind me. You don't need me to read them out. Um, they really are as dynamic as they look in this picture. It's extraordinary. They're very glowing. And uh, this centre is really blessed by two things. We've recruited some excellent people, I think it's fair to say. Always room for improvement, but I think we're, we're off to a good start. And a very high degree of cohesion. That's a horrible piece of jargon to mean people know how to work together. And they're, and they're delighted to do so. On that note, I'll close it. Um, we have uh, a huge amount of work to be doing in the future. We've got a, um, a pedigree uh, going back to the National Centre for Student Equity in Higher Education, which many of you will know, but not all of you will know. We intend to keep that pedigree alive, but adapt it and apply it to some very big policy questions in Australian higher education. Uh, every single person here, and I've listened very carefully to the panel members, um, we may have disagreements about big and small things, but every single person understands the enormity of the task. Unless the research policy and practitioner community come together, and we're very happy to host it, but we're not that precious, uh, I think we're going to get off to a bad start. Let's get off to a good start, and I hope you'll agree that there's been a good couple of days in use of your time. Thank you, everyone, and thank you personally to my team. <laughs>